and I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul, I need you. Like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin Dead man walking, slave to sin all about being born again I need you oh God I need you so take me to the riverside take me under baptize I need you oh God I need you your forgiveness is like sweet sweet honey on my like the sound of a symphony to my ears, like holy water on my skin. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my like the sound of a symphony to my ears it's like holy water your forgiveness it's like sweet sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears like holy Like holy water on my skin Oh, it's like holy water If you could open your Bibles with me this morning Our morning scripture comes from Psalm 145 Starting in verse 8 The Lord is gracious and compassionate Slow to anger and rich in love the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And then going on from verse 14. The Lord upholds all those who fall, and he lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord, that every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Thank you, Beth, for that wonderful reading of Psalm 145. Would you please join with me as we begin this time of looking into God's Word together by opening with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the words from Psalm 145 that you are near to us, 
that you are near to all who call on your name. God, we ask you right now that you would be near to us. That you would allow us to hear your voice through your word. God, that you would speak to us today. Lord, hear our hearts, hear our cries for you. May you fill us. As we talk about your spirit today, God, will you fill us with an abundance, with a fullness that only you can. God, would you use my words to glorify your kingdom today. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, I'm Pastor Dan May. I'm one of the pastors here at First Covenant Church. And I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, whether it's morning or whether it's night, like it is, as you can see from the window behind me, is here while I'm taping this. Uh, but whether it's morning or night, I just want to say welcome and I'm so glad that you have chosen to invest this time of your life into hearing from the Word of God and to connect with us as a church. Um, I'm so honored and I'm so grateful that you have chosen uh, this time to share with us. Uh, we are in the 10th week of a sermon series called The Blazing Center. And The Blazing Center is a sermon series that came out of the Evangelical Covenant Church denomination. And they said, we believe that we need to get back to one of our affirmations, which is having a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. We believe that we need to emphasize this because we, we believe that we're missing it. And so we want to call our people back to the Holy Spirit. And so they asked us pastors to, to uh, present a sermon series that they entitled The Blazing Center. Uh, it was a six-week series. And Chris, in his studies, he just said, you know, there's so much here on the Holy Spirit. We can do better. We can do more. And so we've extended it from six weeks to ten weeks. This is the last and the final week. Uh, Pastor Chris just said, Dan, I want you to end this. I want you to, to, to wrap it up for us. And so here I am this morning uh, or evening, I guess, whichever you want to say. But I'm honored to be able to look at God's Word and to study it with you. This morning we were, are going to be looking at the book of Acts, uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. That's going to be our text, and we will we'll take that um, and look at that for the rest of our time today. So here we have the Apostle Paul. He's embarking on his third missionary journey, and what we know his last missionary journey. And so he's, he's embarking on his third missionary journey, and he travels by land, visits a few different towns, and eventually ends up at the town of Ephesus. Let's begin with chapter 19, verse 1. It reads like this. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. 
On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So here we have Paul coming to an area that just two years earlier the Spirit would not let him go to. But now he is allowed to enter into into Asia and he ends up at Ephesus. And as he begins his time there, he runs into a group of, of men who call themselves disciples. And Paul's excited, great, here's some disciples, I can, we can have conversation, I can see really how God is working in their life and, and what the Spirit is doing and how they love Jesus. And as they're having this conversation and having this dialogue, Paul starts to wonder. You know, the way that you're acting the spirit that I'm getting from you, the, the, you know, I, I don't really know. Have you, have, you even, have you received the Holy Spirit? Because I'm not really sensing it. And these guys in this dialogue, these 12 men are going, what are you talking about, Paul? We've don't know anything about this Holy Spirit. We've never heard of this Holy Spirit. Paul's like, well, how can you be disciples and not have heard the Holy Spirit? What what baptism did you receive then? You know, Paul is really asking them, He's trying to find out, trying to find out, is their faith genuine? Is their faith a living consciousness of God within their soul? Because he wasn't feeling it. Or is their faith a dependence on forms a dependence on creeds, a dependence on ideas. Is their faith genuine? And so he uh, he continued on and asked them, you know, whose baptism did you receive? And they say, John's baptism. And, And then Paul goes, well, that's great. It's great that you received John's baptism, but John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You see, when when John baptized, it was for the repentance of your sins because you realize that what you have done in your life may not be right and you want to repent of that and you want to ask God to forgive you. But John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. But in his teaching, in that baptism, John said, but look, there's going to be somebody else coming. The Messiah is coming. Get your hearts ready. Prepare for the Messiah. Prepare for his teaching. Prepare for the Holy Spirit. Get ready because he's coming. That was John's teaching. And somehow, these group, this group of men, somehow they missed that. Somehow they missed that. That Jesus was coming. And so here they are. They were disciples. They were living a life. Following an ideal. They were doing the things that they thought they needed to do. But there was no life transformation within them. There was nothing within them that said we have experienced something that's revolutionized who we are. And and when Paul saw them and he saw that, he said, brothers, 
we need to fix this. We need to do something about this. And, he so, and so we continue on. And on hearing that they were baptized in John, he said, let's take care of this right now. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he's the Messiah? Do you believe that he is the one who's came, who came to this earth, lived, died, rose again for you, and that you want to be witnesses for him? Do you believe? And they said, yes. On hearing Paul's declarations, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. Amen. That's great. I love that. But... This text, in this section, sometimes it's used as a proof text. A proof text for a systematic way that we are to do something. And so my question right now is, When did the Holy Spirit come on them? This is a study on the Holy Spirit. It's not a study necessarily on, on the journeys of Paul and how he dealt with men. It's a study on the Holy Spirit. So uh, when we're getting into the Holy Spirit here, how does the Holy Spirit come on these men? Because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And now they do. And so this text here says specifically, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. So does that mean that in order for you and I to receive the Holy Spirit today, that we must have somebody who has the Holy Spirit put their hands on us so that we can receive the Holy Spirit? Does this text prove that? Does it? Turn with me to Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10, you have, uh, you have Peter. And he is speaking to the house of Cornelius. And here's Peter, and he's sharing with the house of Cornelius, and he's sharing all about who Jesus is and what Jesus did and how Jesus came to this earth, the same type of story that these disciples just heard. But in Acts 10, it's Peter who's doing the talking. And he's sharing all about Jesus. And what do we find in Acts 10? Let me turn to it real quick. Acts 10, Acts 10 verse 44. Peter's doing his dialogue. He's sharing about who Jesus is. And then at verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Wait a minute. Time out. There's no laying on of hands in this text. In one sense, you've got laying on of hands appearing to be how people receive the Holy Spirit. In another text, you have people hearing the Word of God receiving the Holy Spirit. Earlier in Acts, you've got another group who is gathered together, and they're worshiping God, and they're praying, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit shows up, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And so you have multiple different examples of how the Holy Spirit is received. But in all the stories that we read about the Holy Spirit, the one thing that is true for all of them is that the people believed prior to receiving the Holy Spirit. They all believed. And so, in trying to figure out how do we receive the Holy Spirit, it's not a matter of function, people. It's a matter of faith. 
It's a matter of believing in the name of Jesus Christ. Believing in the name of Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Many of us have learned it since uh, we were a child. Perhaps today may be the first time you hear it. But Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you are saved through what? Through faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. It is a gift of God, not of works, not of anything that we can do, not through going down in the water, coming back up, not by laying on hands, receiving our None of that is not of works that we can do, but it's only through Jesus, through having faith in Jesus as a gift of God. It's the only way that we can receive it. My question for you today is why do you want the Holy Spirit? Why do you want the Holy Spirit? Have you asked yourself the question, why do I want the Holy Spirit? Why did the Holy Spirit come? Why did the Holy Spirit come? Chris has been saying throughout this whole series that this, the Holy Spirit came is so that the will of God could be completed. And what is the will of God? The will of God is to advance the kingdom of God for the glory of God. That's why the Holy Spirit came. It's to advance the kingdom of God for the glory of God. It's to help us to understand God's will. And that's why, we have, that's why Jesus gave the Great Commission, isn't it? You know, we have... Um, when we think of the Great Commission and we think of the Great Commandments, we think of them as really great statements. But did Jesus give them to be great statements? Or did Jesus give them to be a mission for our lives? The Holy Spirit came to keep us on mission. The baptism with the Holy Spirit implies a full experience of the Spirit, which among other things empowers us to witness. The Great Commission says what? Go! <laughs> Number one, go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing them, teaching them about Jesus. That's the Great Commission. That's what God or Jesus has called us to do. In Acts chapter 10, it's another form of the Great Commission. Acts 10 verse 42 says that Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Why do you want the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is given to us to help us fulfill the will of God, which is to grow the kingdom of God. All for God's glory. We are not given the Holy Spirit to 
sit at home, eating our pizza, watching our football games, and just living our comfortable life. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and to have life more abundantly. Are you living a life that is more abundant? The Holy Spirit was given so that we could be witnesses. And for our witness to be effective, It must be just that. It must be witness. What is the definition of witness? Well, I looked it up. It says to witness is to have knowledge of an event or change from personal observation or experience. To have knowledge of from personal observation or experience. Are you a witness for Jesus? Acts 4 verse 20 says, We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Do you find that to be true about your life with Jesus? That you just can't stop speaking about him how he's impacting your life how he's changing your life how he's guiding your life how he's giving you peace are you finding that to be true the will of God is to advance the kingdom of God for the glory of God the Holy Spirit, when you believe, comes upon you. And a new work has begun. If you think about a garden that's producing fruit, what needs to happen to that garden? You need to till the soil. You need to plant the seed. You need to protect the seed. You need to water. You need to keep take care of the seed. Eventually, weeds start to come. Things start to, to attack the seed. And it's our job to protect that fruit. If we want fruit to grow, we have to protect it, so we have to pull the weeds. We have to put the fences up around the fruit so that the animals don't get in. And if you live by me, there's tons of rabbits, so don't plant anything. But you have to put fences up to protect that fruit. And so, if we want good fruit to happen, there's a lot of things along the way that we need to do to prepare for the fruit and to protect the fruit. We need to spend time with the fruit. It's very similar in our spiritual relationship. It's very similar. If left alone, we'd give in to weeds. If left alone, we'd give in to predators. Our lives would be destroyed. But the good news is, is that we have a master gardener who loves us, who wants to take care of us. What's different from fruit in us is that we get to reach out to the master gardener. We get to say, I've got fruit or I've got weeds, I need them taken out I've got predators coming after me and I need your help to clean me up I need your help to protect me 
And the Holy Spirit comes upon our life and He wants to grow our lives, our lives of fruit. And I'm not going to go into all the fruit, the, the, the uh, fruits of the Spirit that you can find in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit comes upon us to create that fruit in our life. It's not immediate, but it's developed over time. As He comes into our life, and each one of us is, 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 has the opportunity for all of these fruit in our life, love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I just said I wasn't going to say them, and there I said them. Um, but the Holy Spirit comes into our life to give those and to fill us and to fulfill us and to allow us to be witnesses to the world because we have fruit, and it's fruit that people want in their life. It's good. But we can't get there, people, if we're allowing the weeds and the predators to destroy our life and to take our time and to take our thoughts. We need to take our thoughts captive, people. And to allow the fruit of the Spirit to be dangling off of our branches so that people, when they come by, say, I want some of that fruit. And when they taste of the fruit, it's so good that they just want more. And that's the fruit that the Holy Spirit provides in our life. But if we don't spend time with the Holy Spirit, if we don't spend time learning who the Holy Spirit is, if we don't spend time learning who Jesus is, if we don't spend time understanding who we are in the middle of all of that, then our fruit's going to be tasteless. We have to spend time. We have to invest time. And honestly, we're called to love God. That's our greatest commandment above all else is to love God. And if you love somebody, that's a song. If you love somebody, you want to spend time with them. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Are we doing that? You can't do the Great Commission if you don't do the Great Commandment. Are we loving God with all of our heart? I, for one, need to do a much better job. The Holy Spirit comes to create this amazing fruit in our life. That's why we want the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also comes to give us gifts. We call them gifts of the Spirit. And you can find... Uh, in the New Testament, you can find them in 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Isaiah, Romans. Um, if you want more on that, go to the app. There's a, a devotional from this week that has uh, more on those there. And the gifts of the Spirit are given. The fruit of the Spirit is given to develop me, to develop you, to develop us so that we can become people who have witness. The gifts of the Spirit are individual. We don't get all of the gifts. We may get one. We may get two. But we don't get all of them. But the reason that we are given the gifts is not so that we can be built up. The reason we are given gifts is so that the kingdom of God can be built up. It's so that when we come together in community that we can grow together and grow God's kingdom. You know, for me personally, when, um, when I left high school and I went to college to be an accountant, I loved numbers and I loved finances and I loved putting it all together and balancing books and, and making all the numbers work. I, I absolutely loved it. I could sit by myself alone for hours. I have pictures of me when I was a little kid and the whole live, living room floor is stacked full of piles of pennies. Hundreds of piles of pennies all stacked perfectly circular all together. 
I love that stuff. I thought I was going to be an accountant, and that was my passion in life. Went to school to do that, and God got a hold of me, and God shook my world. And he said, I love that you love numbers, but I need you to be in the church. And he pulled me out of that. And he pulled me out of the business world when I was venturing my own way. And he pulled me back into the church and he says, the church needs somebody who's focused on numbers. The, need, the church needs somebody whose gift is administration. The church needs you and that's where you need to go. And that's why I'm here today is because God called me out of what I thought my gift was for into what he wanted to use my gift for. That's why we have been given gifts. Do you know your gift? Do you know what God has given you to use in the broader community of the church to glorify him and to create this kingdom that he's calling us to create? As we, are witness for it, as we are witnesses for him. Do you know your gift? I think a lot of times we, uh, I'll mention this and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, a lot of times we think, at least I've thought in the past, um, I really wish that I would have come to faith later in life. You know, if I, if I would have come to faith, say, in my early 20s, you know, after I had a whole rebellious stage, and then would have came to faith, then, you know, then I'd really have a witness. Then I'd be able to talk to somebody and share with them yeah, this is my life change. This is how Jesus got a hold of me and how he, he shaped my life and he changed me and now I'm a Christ follower and you should be one too. But I don't have that story. You know, my story is I was nine years old riding in my, blue, my mom and dad's blue Ford LTD listening to KTIG, uh, uh, Keep Trusting in God. It's a radio station. Um, of northern Minnesota, uh, but listening to the radio station and, and hearing them talk about Jesus and God got a hold of me and said, this is what you need in your life. And I asked Jesus to come into my life and I accepted him and I had no idea what I was doing, but I wanted Jesus. And so I didn't have this whole life change and this all these this, these stories that are going to pull everybody in because my life has drastically changed and God is doing amazing things in my life. I've just kind of been there all of my life. But when I look back, I can see God's hand moving me, God's hand protecting me, God's hand guiding me. It'll be okay, Dan. I'm going to use you. You're my child. I'm going to protect you. The story that God wants us to share is not the dramatic life change that I once was horrible and now God has saved me. If that's your story, praise God. I love it, thank you. And I'm excited that God changed your life. But for many of us who've accepted Jesus as, an, as a young child, we really have to wrestle with our identity and who we are and why we are Christians and what we are called to do. But the emphasis I want to make on this is that it's not about the drastic life change for us. It's about what is God doing in our lives? And if we're not spending time with God, if we're not spending time reading His Word, if we're not spending time listening to Him, the devotional, the first devotional that went out on Thursday, the prayer for that devotional was simply, listen. 
to the Spirit? Are we listening? Our witness comes from a firsthand knowledge of who God is. So what is your witness? Why do you want the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit comes upon us so that we can advance God's mission in this world. The Holy Spirit brings gifts, amazing gifts, gifts that really transform your life. Our God is a good God. Will you follow his commandment to love him with all your heart? And will you follow his commission to preach the word to the world, to let them know how God is changing your life today? Let's invite the Holy Spirit into our life. Not because he's not already there, but because I think we've pushed him aside. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into our life and press forward in the time that we have left. Press forward into loving Jesus and to making Jesus known. God, <laughs> we say that we love you. But God, I ask today that that would be reality. That we would truly love you. That like these disciples who thought they knew but didn't really know. May that not be our reality. May we really know who you are. May you fill our lives with this Holy Spirit that fills us full of fruit and, and, and presents us with gifts. May we be your witnesses to the world, to Wilmer, Minnesota, God. May you guide us. Give us your passion. Give us your heart. Lord, I think today of those who have not been having very good weeks lately. Whether it be heart attacks or brain tumors or low hemoglobin, God, whatever it may be that is, is touching people's lives, maybe it was a, a doctor's appointment that didn't go well, perhaps a surgery gone wrong, perhaps a surgery delayed. God, I don't know where everyone is at today, but you do. And I ask that you would enter into their lives and that they would see you in their space that they would feel you and know that you are there. Would you give them a hug today? God, for those who are seeing victories in their life right now, in this time where there's so many, where there's so many uncertainties, they're seeing victories and things are going well and and they just don't understand this whole time and concept and what people are so worried about. I just, I pray, Lord, I just thank you for their life and for the way that you're working in their lives. Lord, we thank you. I thank you. Thank you for the hope of the future. Thank you for the promise of today and the promise of your Holy Spirit. May the, may the Holy Spirit fill us to abundance, as I said earlier. 
and may we overflow from our love of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. spoke it to be you were the king of kings yeah you were yeah you were and now you're reigning still enthroned above all things angels and saints cry out we join them as we sing glory to please receive the benediction and that is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 and 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 through 24. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice 
always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And may God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful.